Ladies and gentlemen, very good morning. Um, I hope you can hear me well. Thank you for joining our webinar about understanding and activating seafood consumers in Europe. Um, we have hundreds of participants in this webinar from all across Europe, all sorts of stakeholder backgrounds from science, fisheries, actors in seafood supply chains, retailers and NGOs. My name is Camille Deriks. I'm the regional director for MSC in Europe, and I'm together with Abby Curtis, um, Associate Director of Globescan Market Research, and Richard Stobart, the Head of Marketing at MSC, and we will take you through the next hour, in which we will go through the following agenda. If my slide comes true, there it is. Um, I will do an introduction and background to the MSC program and link marketing and consumers to our charitable vision and mission. And after that five minutes introduction, I will hand over to Abby, who will give you an overview of the results of our recent consumer survey in Europe. Richard will subsequently give more background to how we use these insights in our marketing and positioning. And I will follow that with examples of marketing campaigns across Europe. Um, finally, um, the floor is yours. You will have opportunity to ask questions to us, which we will do our best to answer. Altogether, I think the webinar will last about one hour. Um, without further ado, I'll quickly start with my introduction on the MSC program. Um, and as many of you know, the MSC was created in the mid-90s. Um, as a groundbreaking initiative between WWF and Unilever to help reverse the downward trend in global fish stocks. Today, 21 years on, the MSC is an independent global non-profit NGO with a vision of the world's oceans teeming with life and seafood supplies safeguarded for this and future generations. And we have a mission, uh, which is to use our eco-label and fisheries certification program to contribute to the health of the world's oceans by recognizing and rewarding sustainable fisheries practices, influencing choices people make when buying seafood, and working with our partners to transform the seafood market to a sustainable basis. Um, the MSC theory of change supports us to make progress against our vision and mission. And this is all about driving value for certified fisheries. Um, based on the value for MSC certification in the market, fisheries can voluntarily seek to be certified against MSC standards for sustainable fishing. And in order to do so, fisheries are assessed in an independent, rigorous, transparent, and science-based process by a team of experts. Um, and if the fisheries demonstrate that they meet the standards, um, then they get certified. If fisheries get certified, often improvements have to be delivered and often have already been delivered prior to certification. 94% of fisheries after certification, improvements are made for closing their conditions. And these changes made by fisheries in the program after certification, we've monitored and tracked, um, and we've in total reported some 1,200 improvements by fisheries over the years. Um, and these can be anything from, say, reduction of bird mortality in, in a fishery in South Africa for Hague, where albatross mortality dropped more than 90%, or improved science and reduced scientific uncertainty about the impacts of a fishery on endangered, threatened, protected species, like in the case of the Sea of Ojosk Pollock fisheries, or the adoption of better management measures, such as harvest control rules, like in the case of Indian Ocean skipjack tuna and many more. All in all, um, this is our theory of change. Um, and in my personal view, it's not just a theory, but it's actually change being delivered by fisheries in our program to demonstrate sustainability against the MSC standard. Everything we do at MSC is at service of this environmental bottom line. Um, equally, the work we do with consumers. But as I said earlier, um, as a market-based program, the role of consumers is absolutely key in our theory of change. Our mission says that we want to influence consumer choices when buying seafood. And to understand how to best do this, how to influence those consumers, it's vital to understand them and to know what drives them in their purchases, to understand what they're concerned about. 
For that reason, we have since 2008 engaged in market research. And over the past years, we have worked closely with Globescan, um, a world leading market research agency, which also has uh, conducted the latest MSE consumer survey earlier this year. Um, it is my pleasure to hand over to Abby Curtis to take us through the results of this. Thank you very much, Camille. And good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. As Camille said, my name is Abby, and I'm from the Globescan team, and I've been working with the MSC now for about three or four years. And I'm very happy to be with you today, and I'm going to take you through the MSC consumer insights that we've been working on this year. Uh, so just a brief introduction, firstly, to Globescan and who we are. We are a strategy and research consultancy. Uh, we work not only with organizations like the MSC and its peers like Fair Trade International and FSC, but we also work with corporate clients as well, um, not only on certification research, but more broadly on things like sustainability communications and sustainable behavior change research as well. So we're in the fortunate position that we are able to place uh, insights like these into the context uh, facing both organizations like MSC and corporate clients as well. So what will I be talking about today? Well, I'll be talking about the latest program of research that we have run with the MSC, uh, which we fielded earlier this year in January and February. The global study was um, conducted in 22 different countries around the world, and it was an online consumer survey. Today, I'll be focusing specifically on 14 of these countries, and they are uh, the countries in Europe. So you can see, you should be able to see on this slide here, we have the 14 countries listed. Um, and you can see them on the map as well. And our total sample in our study was over 25,000 consumers. Today, I'll be focusing in, as I said, on Europe, which is 15,000, um, a sample of 15,000 nationally representative uh, studies in each of the, the countries on this page. And we also honed in specifically on seafood consumers, of which we have just over 11,000 in our sample today. So a very robust sample size, especially when we look at it at the the European level. So what will I be talking about today? We've got four key topics I'd like to run you through. Firstly, I'll be talking about whether people actually care about the oceans. Is seafood something that people care about? Are these topics relevant to people? Then we'll be looking at how and whether people are actually acting on their values and how they are translating their concerns into action or not, as the case may be. Then, most interestingly, we will look at how to trigger action. So how do we actually convert people's values into behaviors in the store in particular? And then I'll pass back over to my colleague here, Richard, at the MSC, and he will talk a bit more about how the MSC and its partners are engaging consumers and bring some of this to life a bit. Okay, so let's get going. So firstly, do people actually care about the oceans? Are these topics actually relevant to people? Well, I'd like to start us off by looking at seafood in particular and whether people actually enjoy eating seafood. So you should be able to see on this page, we've got a pie chart here which shows how much people actually enjoy eating fish and seafood. And we kicked off our survey with some questions around consumption and this question in particular around enjoyment because we really wanted to understand if seafood is something people like to eat. Is it something that people enjoy having as part of their, their diet? And what we found was around a third of people across our um, study globally say that they really like to eat fish or seafood. And we've deemed this group our seafood lovers. And I will mention these, uh, these people, this group, a few times as I go through the presentation today. We have a further 41% of people who say that they like to eat fish or seafood, which brings that total uh, percentage of people who enjoy seafood up to about three quarters or 75%. So a strong majority of people who say that they enjoy eating seafood. So it's by no means is this a, a niche product or a niche food. It's very much a part of the mainstream for people in terms of their enjoyment. The figures differ somewhat by market. You can see on the bottom of this page here, we've got the percentage of people who really like seafood in each of these different countries in our study. Just to pull out some of the European figures, on the left-hand side there, we have Italy at 44% really like and on the uh, right-hand side, slightly lower in the Netherlands, at 25% of people who say that they really like to eat seafood. So there is some variation there, but roughly speaking, we've got about a third of people. And what about seafood sustainability then? 
So we have a whole host of questions in our survey, and I, can't, I don't have time to share all of them today, but the, the really key metric that I did want to share with you all was the percentage of seafood consumers that tell us that they believe that we need to protect fish and shellfish so that future generations of people can enjoy eating seafood. So that continuity piece, or that sustainability piece. And we have a really strong majority, 84% of people across Europe, saying that they do believe that we need to protect fish species so that our children and our grandchildren can continue to enjoy eating seafood. So a, a clear, <laughs> clear need here to protect fish, and, and consumers really do recognise that. There's a majority in all of the European countries in our study as well. So you can see on the right-hand side, again, the Netherlands is at the bottom, but it's still a strong majority of uh, more than three quarters, right up to 92% of people in France. So it's almost unquestioned in France, um, countries like France and Spain and Poland, for example, that we do need to be protecting uh, seafood stocks and we need to protect fish species. Okay, so we know that people care. We've got a whole host of metrics in our survey that prove this, in particular the one that I just shared with you. But are people actually living up to this? So we know that they care, but is this something that translates when they're actually in the shop and they're making their purchase decisions? Well, this is a notoriously difficult question <laughs> to answer. So in order to um, uncover this and unpack this a bit for the MSD, we used um, a special methodology as part of our survey called maximum differentiation, <laughs> which you don't need to to understand, but essentially it's a trade-off exercise. So we did not just ask consumers, are these things important to you, and had everyone tick everything. We actually <clears throat> conducted an exercise where people needed to pick the most and the least important attributes to them. Uh, they repeated that several times with randomized sets of attributes, and then uh, this led us to be able to determine which of these factors really are the most important to people, and what really motivates them when they're purchasing fish and seafood. And you can see the list of attributes that we tested there on the right-hand side. And we have some of those conventional uh, measures like taste or price or freshness. And we've mixed that up with several different sustainability elements as well. And here are the results. So there's a lot to digest on this page. But the first thing to say is that the absolute numbers that we have here uh, those are just the relative importance scores. So you don't need to worry about the numbers, but what's important is the rank order of these different attributes and how, to what extent they motivate people when purchasing seafood. So the ones at the top are the most dominant motivators. They're really, really important to people. And you can see that we have four dominant motivators at the top here. So we have freshness, taste, good for my health, good for my family's health, and safe to eat. And if a fish or a seafood product doesn't satisfy one of these criteria, it's unlikely to, that someone would want to purchase it. They really are core and necessary for the seafood purchase decision. So that's probably the most important takeaway from this page. And then secondly, we can see that sitting just below those core uh, conventional motivators, we have sustainability. So sustainably sourced or environmentally friendly, and just below that, we have price. And the scores that are very, very similar, which says to us that consumers are really trying to balance these two things. Um, neither one comes out clearly above the other. They're very, very, very similar scores. Uh, so it shows that people really value sustainability when they're making that purchase, not as much as freshness or taste, but it is important to people. And it's something that they're really weighing up against the price of the product, particularly we see this in Europe. So this picture would look quite different if we were to look at the results say, in North America or in Asia, where price is more important and sustainability is relatively slightly less important, although it does still matter to people. And as well as uh, different pictures regionally, we also have different results when we look at different countries within Europe. So the page that you're seeing here is the European average. It actually closely reflects the French results. So in France, consumers are telling us that they are balancing sustainability and price. Uh, very closely, <clears throat> but in some other countries, price is deemed relatively less important and sustainability really comes out top. Um, and those markets include places like Germany, Austria, Switzerland, and the UK as well, where I am sitting today. However, in some other markets, perhaps somewhat surprisingly, uh, Denmark, Finland, for example, Norway, as well as some of those Nordic countries, actually sustainability falls a little bit lower. So in those markets, people are more price conscious um, and we need to do a better job in communicating sustainability in order to, 
to um, get people to live up to their, the values that we know that they have. So it's a different picture by different countries. And we also have some variation by different demographic groups as well, so age um, and particularly gender. And now I've said that, I can see that we have a question in. Uh, so Camille, would you like to, can I move to you to ask, ask that question? Sure. Yes. Um, the question is, are there any differences in gender or other demographics and attitudes towards seafood purchase? Um, and maybe I, I can give this to um, to Richard first, or Abby, would you like to start and then Richard to comment after? Yeah, I can answer that one, Camille, and then I'll hand over to Richard to give the, the MSC. Okay. Very good question, and something that I was about to talk about naturally, and then I saw the question come in, uh, which shows you that it's a good one. Um, so in terms of gender, we do have some interesting differences when we look at this. We see that female shoppers, generally speaking, prioritise sustainability a bit higher. So that is a really key finding. Is, um, the females, when they're making their shopping decisions, place even more value on sustainability and a bit less so on price. <coughs> However, when we look at something like age, there tends to be less of a demographic difference uh, between the groups. So it's really more around the gender piece where we see interesting differences here. And I'll hand to Richard in case he wants to add his perspective. No, nothing really to add there, Abby. Um, I mean, the the, um, the gender thing uh, definitely differs around the world, um, and we we see some very interesting patterns come out of that. Um, what what we do know is that uh, gender is not normally something that uh, that splits surveys like this, but for some reason, uh, it, it does in this survey, um, and we we we're looking into uh, that a bit further as uh, time goes on. Thanks, Richard. And if anyone does have any more questions, I'd encourage you to write them in the um, question box and we will pause again towards the end and answer some of those more questions. Okay, so we'll keep going. So we know that people care about this topic. People care about the sustainability of the oceans and preserving seafood for future generations. And we know that they do place some value on sustainability when they're shopping as well. But in practice, I think we'd all, um, we'd all admit that we're not seeing as much action as we'd like. We're not seeing as many sustainable behaviours from consumers or as much sustainable seafood purchase as we'd like to see. Um, so we've been looking at how we can help consumers to actually act on their values. And to take you through the section, I'll be using a very straightforward and simple framework that Globescan have put together. This is based not only on our work with the MSC, but our broader sustainability communications work. Um, and it's based on findings from quantitative surveys as well as qualitative focus groups. And what we've found at Globescan is if we want to trigger more sustainable behaviours from consumers, including purchase of sustainable products, there are four key triggers. So firstly, we need to educate, we need to equip, we need to excite people, and then finally, we need to engage them. And I'll be talking about each of these in turn now. So let me start with the education piece. So at Globescan, our perspective is it's very difficult to change behavior and engage people on a topic if they know nothing about it. If it's not something that resonates with people or they've even heard of, it's very unlikely that we will be able to engage them and, and change how they, they behave. So the first piece, the really foundational piece, is education. We need to make sure that people understand, even at a basic level, the issues that we're talking about. And sustainability is a very complicated topic, so this is not always easy. However, when we look specifically at ocean sustainability, we feel that there actually has been a good foundation um, of consumer knowledge and consumer awareness on this topic. So something that springs to mind immediately is the Blue Planet 2, <clears throat> the Blue Planet 2 documentary. So particularly a big success in the UK. We had uh, millions and millions of people watching it last year. I think it was the, the year's most watched program in the whole country, which is a huge success for a documentary. It's also been popular in other countries around the world where it's been exported to, and in particular places like China, where it's been watched by millions of people. And it's not just this documentary, but more broadly, a lot of the imagery that we have that really documents and, and shows the beauty of the oceans in contrast with some of the problems that they're facing, so the plastics pollution in particular, 
these images often go viral, they travel around the world, they get shared and retweeted. And this has really helped to raise ocean issues up the agenda. And we can see that when we search, when we do Google Trends searches, we can see that consumer interest has, is really increasing in this topic. So there's a good level of com consumer awareness and education already on this topic. And what we wanted to understand at Globescan and MSC was given the complexities of the ocean sustainability issue, which particular uh, issues or concerns were the most pressing for the normal person on the street? So is it, is it just pollution? Is it just plastic pollution? Or are there, are there other ocean sustainability issues that people care about as well? And in order to understand this, we asked people to tell us what the most um, concerning potential ocean issues are to them. So which ones worry them the most? And you can see the results on this page here. So unsurprisingly, we have pollution of the oceans, particularly plastics pollution, comes top here. So we have two thirds of people selecting that as one of their top uh, most concerning issues. But just behind that, 46%, so a strong solid base of people, have also selected overfishing and depletion of fish species as one of their most concerning issues. <clears throat> so we can see that it's not just the plastics debate uh, that's really dominating here, although it is the most concerning issue. We have a plethora of other issues um, here that, that concern people. So they do understand the complexities of, of the ocean sustainability topic. And how would people like to learn more? Well, we asked people which of these channels they'd like to hear more um, about ocean sustainability from. And seafood packaging is, is the leader here. We've got half of people saying that they'd like to see, hear more about the sustainability of their products on seafood packaging. Uh, so there's a clear case there for more communications on pack. But interestingly, we also have nearly half of the people in our survey saying that they'd also like to hear more on the TV and via the radio as well, and 39% through magazines or newspaper articles, which I think when we discuss this here, it says to us that we need this multi-channel approach where possible to get these messages across, and people will respond to that positively. They don't just want to see it on a packet, but they want actually deeper, um, deeper knowledge and deeper information about this through a range of different channels. So we've talked about education. Let's look at the equip piece then. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we know that people need to have a basic level of awareness or education on the topic, but we also clearly need to give people the solutions that they need in order to be able to live up to their values. Without those solutions, it would be very difficult for people to change their behavior. And of course, one of the, um, the most relevant <laughs> to today's session, one of the most relevant solutions that we can provide is clear labeling of a sustainable option. So whether this is independent labeling or otherwise, uh, this is one of the clear solutions that we see uh, to, in order to equip consumers with what they need to make those sustainable purchase decisions. And in our survey, we wanted to understand whether independent labeling, third party certification, is something that is actually relevant to people. Is it something that they actually want to see? And we can see we have 73%, so another clear majority of people, saying that they would like supermarkets and brands' claims about sustainability to be clearly labelled by an independent organisation. So there is an appetite here for that third party piece, the third party um, verification or certification. <clears throat> However, when we look at whether people notice eco-labels on their shopping, so whether they actually notice these certifications, we have just 45% of people saying that they notice them. So we don't have a majority there. We have a clear gap between the demand or the appetite for independent labeling versus the actual visibility of that labeling. And actually that 45% is relatively strong. In Europe, it's much higher than it is in uh, re regions like Asia or North America, for example. But even in Europe, where we have some very well-established um, certification markets like Germany and Austria, even here, it's, it's still a majority of people and just not noticing eco-labels. And this is really the ongoing challenge that we are facing as an industry. It's how can we get these messages out to people so that they actually hear them and they actually see them? <clears throat> so how about the MSC specifically then? Let's shift the focus now to look at some of the key metrics that we have about the Marine Stewardship Council in our survey. So how is the MSC doing on visibility? Well, in Europe, 
in our study earlier this year, we uh, had 47% of people in Europe saying that they recall seeing the MSC label either often or occasionally, so nearly half, which does feel relatively strong given that this is a, a label that's only on seafood products. It's not a multi-product label. Um, we've got a solid base of people, and this is increasing as well. So our study in 2016 had 43%. So it's going in the right direction in terms of visibility and awareness. Even within Europe, though, there are big differences by country. So you can see here, again, on the left-hand side, those biggest bars show that the highest number of people who have seen or recognized the MSC label. Switzerland, Austria, and Germany have got almost... I think it's two-thirds, just over two-thirds of people have uh, say they've seen the MSC label and they recognize that and they know what it stands for. And that's a really strong, <laughs> really strong figures, but not something that surprises me at all. Having worked with other organizations such as Fair Trade, FSC, people in these markets are much more clued up than they are elsewhere. Some people are able to reel off dozens of different certifications that they look for when they're shopping. So generally, consumers are pretty clued up in those markets, and it's no surprise to me that the MSC has been very successful there. Uh, on the other hand, we have Poland and Norway, which are less well-established markets in terms of certifications, and in particular, the MSC has lower levels of awareness there, although still we have about a quarter of people who say they've seen the label. So what about some of these other metrics that we've got here, if I can just move the slide. So how about trust? We've got 69% of people in Europe who've seen the MSC label say that they trust it. So relatively strong there. It's certainly in terms of the other work that Globescan does with our other clients. We always ask a trust question, and this is a relatively high, high figure compared to some of our other clients, particularly compared to corporate um, levels of corporate trust and trust in companies. Um, we also ask an unprompted, a spontaneous question, asking people what they understand by the MSC label. And people type in their answers, and then we read through thousands of those, and we code them in order to understand whether people understand what the MSC means. And to that question, we have about 40% of people giving a correct answer. So 40% of people spontaneously connect the MSC label with either sustainability or certification. That, again, is relatively strong compared to the other markets that we have in the study. So the European figure there is, is strong, but we can see there's still room to even further improve that level of understanding. So one more slide in this section that I'd like to share. Just looking a bit deeper into this concept of trust in the MSC label, we know that consumer trust is so important nowadays we're running on a, a very perniciously low levels of trust, particularly in business. So understanding what sits behind trust in a certification scheme is very key to making sure that that, that scheme uh, can be successful in the long term. And on this slide here, I've got a, a simplified structural equation model, <laughs> probably not simple enough. Um, but what I really want to call your attention to is the left-hand side of this model which shows that the independence piece and the strictness of standards, so consumers perceiving that the MSC has high standards and holds companies to account, those pieces are really foundational when it comes to trust. They really underpin trust in the certification. And without that independence, without that strictness of standards and the openness and traceability piece as well, people's trust would be much more shaky um, and much more fragile and less likely to withstand um, any problems that happen reputationally. So that independence piece is very key, and I think this is a very important finding here, particularly for any retailers who are considering uh, independent certification versus their own schemes. Without that sense of independence and that sense of a high standard, people are less likely to feel that the MSC enables them to shop sustainably, and they're less likely to feel that the MSC actually sustains fish populations. And those two things are really crucial to trust and in turn drive purchase of MSC products. So the third piece in my framework here for consumer engagement is excitement. So we need to have a positive vision and we need to connect this with personal benefits. What is in it for the individual? And I know that Richard will come on to this later uh, from the MSC perspective, but I just wanted to share a couple of the insights from our study. 
So the need for a positive vision is very clear to us here at GlobeScan. Uh, 2017 was a pivotal year because we saw in our GlobeScan radar research, so a different study that we conduct around the world each year, we saw that the level of pessimism in the world was increasing and the percentage of people who disagree that their children and grandchildren will have a higher quality of life actually surpassed the number of people who agree. So a really important year in 2017 where that level of pessimism overtook the optimism for the future. So what we wanted to um, understand with the MSC was which MSC messages will really resonate the most with people and what will motivate people and compel them to actually purchase MSC certified or sustainable seafood. And of these different messages, we have four that really bubble to the top. So the top message that resonates with people around the world is ensuring seafood that we enjoy now is available for future generations. So it's coming back to that finding that I shared right at the beginning of the presentation, that this emotional message of protecting seafood for our children and for our grandchildren really resonates with people. It's something that everyone agrees with, and in terms of the messages that MSC can communicate, this is the one that will most motivate people to make their purchase. There are three other secondary uh, MSC messages that also, that also resonate with people. Um, and these are two of them are very environmental in their focus, so helping to stop the destruction of life in the oceans, and also helping to protect the oceans as well. So a negative and a positive version uh, there of the environmental protection piece. And also consumers want to just be reassured that their seafood is from a sustainable source as well. So we've summarized this as optimal messaging or the most inspiring messaging. It needs to have an emotional component. It needs to be backed up with the environmental evidence and it needs to provide reassurance to consumers as well. And with that, I will move to the next page and hand over, I think, to Richard, who will be talking about how the MSC engages consumers, um, how it actually brings consumers along, creates a movement, involves people using inspiring storytelling. Thanks, Abby. So uh, w I just want to talk a little bit about uh, engagement and uh, what we've learned about en engaging consumers with the sustainability message um, across the, the past few years. So the first um, thing that we uh, certainly need to think about is if uh, people are not thinking about where their food comes from, then they are unlikely to consider the uh, concept of sustainability. So first of all, we define our audience as people who consume seafood and have enough basic knowledge of the oceans and fishing and of the origins of their food to digest the MSC's value proposition, which is wild, traceable, sustainable seafood. And when they, when they shop, they aspire to a better, healthier life um, and balancing the right thing to do with what we call the cool thing to do. And so that's really saying that we do not have a, a right to talk to people about sustainability directly. We have to talk to them about um, the, their own interests and about why sustainability might benefit them in some shape or form. And so our ambition and our objective is to become the easiest and most trustworthy choice for enjoying world sustainable seafood. Um, and we achieve this by helping consumers uh, understand what the MSC label means, as Abby has pointed out. And one of the most important things to learn when you're communicating sustainability is that generally uh, people will not engage with you if you talk about um, the, the deep ocean conservation area that we uh, generally uh, delve into in our everyday lives when we work in this sector. So I describe this as the, the what's in it for me. Um, and if we want to create behavior change, then we have to consider what's in it for the consumer. How do we make sustainability relevant to my world from the consumer's point of view? And so what we try and do is we try to connect um, food to sustainable oceans. So a lot of ocean conservation organizations uh, talk directly about the deep blue oceans and ocean conservation. Um, what we believe is that if we want to connect with the mainstream consumer, that we have to make it relevant to their world. And the way they, we do that is to connect to people's lives and plates. Um, 
and also to, to think about in different countries um, what sustainability means to, to people and, and their cultural environment as well. And so our positioning is the people who love seafood choose the MSC. Um, and what we've uh, continued to do at, at the MSC, we hope, is, is to try to recognize um, why people love seafood and what it means to them. And as Abby previously pointed out, one of the very, very strong emotional connections that we can make with people is to talk about um, preserving seafood for future generations. So making sure that uh, this reflects on people's lives and uh, their, their future generations and their children and making sure that seafood is, is protected for uh, future generations. And just as one case in point, we also, we've started to create some work at the MSC, which starts to talk to the future generations. And if you look on our website, you'll see a section which says for teachers and for learning. And we have a, a film that we've created, which really brings that to life um, and shows that uh, actually future generations is incredibly important as, a, as an audience for us as well. Um, and as, again, Abby has pointed out, those future generations do tend to uh, look at eco-labels more readily than uh, the older generations. And so on that, I want to hand over to my colleague, Camille Dietrich, again. Thank you, Richard. And Abby, um, to talk us through the, the great results, actually, of the consumer survey and, and the MSC positioning. And it's visible clearly that the awareness um, around the MSC Eco label in Europe is growing, the understanding is growing, um, and the latest developments in European markets confirm this also from a demand perspective. Um, so what I wanted to, to um, talk to you about is what, what is happening in the markets very quickly, um, which is that we've seen a growth of the use of the MSC Eco label year on year of about 20 to 30 percent, um, and today about 28,000 product lines, stock keeping units carry the MSC Eco label across Europe, with the German speaking zone being the um, strongest markets, uh, followed by the UK. And, and this corresponds closely with some of the observations in the consumer survey, where we saw that um, Germany, Switzerland, Austria are very high in terms of eco-label awareness. Um, from a market perspective, in the EU28, um, we see that some 10% of all volume in seafood consumed in Europe is now labeled. Um, that said, there is huge diversity. Um, in the north of Europe, in Germany, or markets like the Netherlands and uh, Sweden, we see 40, perhaps 50% of seafood carrying the MSC Eco label, wild seafood. In South Europe, um, that proportion is much lower. Um, say 1% or less of the seafood consumed in Spain, for instance, carries the Eco label. And this is an interesting, um, um, say, difference in that um, the awareness levels and the recognition levels correspond, in our view, to a large extent with the amount of MSC label seafood on the shelves of retailers. And it's also important from a perspective of using that demand to incentivize fisheries to start in their journey towards the MSC. And knowing that 60% of seafood consumption in Europe sits in South Europe, sits in, sits in three countries actually, in France, Spain, and Italy, um, we hope that the very strong development um, in consumer awareness and recognition across Europe will incentivize the uptake of more label products in those markets. We've seen that over the last two years, um, the growth has been very strong in France and, and Spain and Portugal and Italy, um, but obviously um, more market engagement in that area is, is very useful to help turn the tide for our oceans. Um, now, we live in a time where um, the, the oceans are under, under pressure, and that's um, increasingly high on the um, radar also of public authorities. And one of the things I wanted to show you is um, what public authorities have done um, to, to help um, make the right choices from a public procurement perspective. And you see here in the Nordic markets, but also in France, um, in Germany, Netherlands, and Italy, 
Public authorities have built MSC into their procurement policies for, for instance, the City of Paris Sustainable Food Plan or Public Agriculture and Fisheries Directorate in Fisheries um, have in Denmark um, built MSC in procurement policies. Um, these um, drive demand, these public procurement policies, and that helps obviously fisheries to come into the MSC program. Um, we also um, see from a market perspective um, the MSC raising increasingly its voice. Um, so in, in terms of how we do that, many of you probably know that we are working actively with partners in the supply chain to drive campaigns. Um, so we, in that case, work together with retailers and brands, um, journalists to get our messages across to incentivize choice for um, sustainable seafood. Um, increasingly working in shops, but also on the streets. And you see in the top left corner an example of um, a train um, painted in MSC blue, making um, consumers in Italy aware um, of, of the MSC and, and, the, and the positive choices they can make for sustainable seafood. We work with partners, and partners do their own thing. In the top right, you see um, uh, a small part of a campaign that Lidl uh, ran in the UK, Lidl is a, a main driver for sustainable seafood across Europe, um, and in the UK they featured a campaign, amongst other, on sustainable fishing from mussels in the Shetland Islands, taking one of their shoppers out there and surprising him with how good their mussels were produced. Um, another example of how we talk to consumers is with fishermen. And in the bottom left, you see three generations of the albacore fishermen from northern Spain, a granddad his son and his grandson that have worked with the ocean and on the ocean sustainably for many generations and were awarded MSC certification last year for the North Atlantic albacore fishery. And we um, shot videos with them and we helped them to be recognized for that at, at the consumer level with partners throughout Spain in the supply chain. And last but not least, um, we tried to, to work on thought leadership. Um, on the bottom right, you see uh, an image shot at an event we staged in Paris last year, uh, where 250 stakeholders from France were present discussing the state of our oceans and sustainability, and where MSC, together with leading scientists, environmentalists, and market actors, uh, defined the course and um, um, set out um, how consumers could play a positive role in driving sustainability. Um, these are all a few examples, but um, I have a much better um, overview actually in a short video I wanted to share with you so you can see what we have done across Europe in terms of campaigns.
So that gave a very good overview of our 20th anniversary campaign we ran last year in uh, many markets and how we try to connect fisheries and the oceans with people's um, everyday lives and um, hope to incentivize them to choose for sustainable seafood. Um, now we've come to the final part of our uh, presentation and I'd like to quickly wrap up um, what we've gone through before opening the floor for you all um, to ask questions. Um, I think we've clearly seen that ocean sustainability is very, very important for European consumers. Um, and as Abby explained, um, purchase drivers are a price, but definitely sustainability is balanced with that. Um, we want to trigger more action, and we need to trigger more action for the benefit of our oceans. And for that purpose, we um, educate, and we use the popular channels to raise awareness of ocean sustainability. And we equip, we utilize high visibility eco-labeling campaigns in Europe. Um, we do that with our partners. And we try to excite our audiences, make sure that consumers understand that this is something that they can contribute to, but also that there's something in there for them. Um, and future generations messaging is, is clearly um, hitting a snare. Um, and last but not least, our engagement and the power of partnerships um, are absolutely critical to become mainstream. Um, and, and we are very grateful for the many partners that have over the years been contributing and hope that we can um, scale our partnerships up in the years to come. Um, having said all this, I see there's actually a lot of questions um, and we have about 10 minutes left. So um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce the first one. Um, and that is let me see. Um, does the survey uncover anything about the attitudes of younger consumers to environmental and ocean issues? Um, Abby, can I give that one to you first? Yes, of course. Thank you very much, Camille. Uh, so it's a great question, and I only wish I had longer to go into this because it's a very complex picture with the younger consumer group. But it's certainly worthy of uh, more analysis and um, uh, a closer look. Because what we see is that there are some indicators that younger consumers are possibly less concerned, actually, about ocean sustainability issues. However, how we're interpreting that is actually that some of the older generations, older consumers, are more pessimistic. So they've been around for a long time, they've not seen as much progress, so that group are very pessimistic, whereas the younger group are more optimistic. Um, having said that, the younger generation, there's some very positive signs regarding independent certification. So they recognize labels, they're looking for labels, they're, the awareness of MSC, for example, is significantly higher among the younger group than it is among the older group. So there's conflicting signals there in terms of their concern about sustainability versus the, the demand and the, uh, the awareness of eco-labels. So it's very interesting. Um, but generally, we see that younger people are holding companies in particular to a higher standard and to, holding them to account uh, more than the generations previous. And just to add to that, Abby, I mean, what we do see is evidence that younger people, um, as you've said, are, are navigating their purchasing using eco-labels, and they, they navigate using eco-labels much more readily than some of the older uh, uh, groups that we've tested. And also, um, we see some evidence that younger people are um, a, a little bit more um, connected in the world and therefore are uh, more happy to talk about their um, selection of eco-labels and to uh, discuss sustainability uh, issues amongst their peer groups, um, either verbally or, or on social media. Thank you. Um, another question coming in. Um, is the current focus on plastics here to stay and does that affect concern around overfishing? Um, again, Abby, I think from the consumer's insight perspective, maybe could you go first? Yes, thanks Camille. I mean, first from just a personal perspective, I see the consumer attention on the plastics issue as, as quite inspiring at the moment actually. I think it shows the power of the consumer and the power of mass movements in order to create change. We've seen so many different policy announcements both from business and government. Um, I would like to stress though the data from our survey 
does show that it's not just plastics that people are concerned about. We did see the, the chart earlier. And in particular, actually, coming back to the last question on younger consumers, when we look at that younger group, the 18 to 24-year-olds, Gen X, we actually see a broader set of issues that they are concerned about. So they're even more concerned about climate change, for example, and the impact of that on our oceans beyond just plastics. So while plastics is getting all the attention, and that's great in some ways, people are aware that there are other issues out there. And I think the challenge for MSC and for partners is how we can tap into that plastics concern um, and create broader change and a, a, a movement for broader change. Yeah, I mean, just to add to that, it, you know, is the plastics uh, issue a, a around for the long term? I, I, I certainly think so and hope so. But, but you must also look at the, the rapid rise that it's seen uh, just over a period of, you know, six months um, since some of the, the, the events in the media and since uh, Blue Planet drew attention to it as well. Um, this, is, this has been an issue that's come to the fore very, very quickly and therefore, you know, potentially it is a fragile one that could disappear um, or, or drop off gradually. But I, I really hope it's around for a long time because it does the whole ocean conservation world a, a big favour by um, uh, making the problem visible. Thank you. Um, then a question about what do you mean with fresh? Um, is it compared to frozen? Um, again, Abby, maybe you can reflect on that from um, Globescan, how you tested this. Yes, of course. Um, and I'm assuming that this question comes uh, from that motivators chart that I showed where fresh was one of the top motivators. In our survey, we left it very simple. We just used the word fresh, I think, or perhaps it was freshness. Um, so it wasn't compared to frozen. We were just asking people how much it matters to them that their seafood is fresh. But what was really interesting in the findings, actually, was when we looked specifically at frozen seafood, so the people who told us that they consume frozen seafood, we asked them what motivated them, and freshness still comes very high, actually. So despite the fact that we might think on first glance fresh and frozen are the opposite, they're actually not. We know that you can freeze uh, fresh fish and keep it fresh, and consumers very much um, appreciate that. And actually buying frozen uh, fish in some cases is a way for them to get that freshness. So that was something that we found quite surprising, actually, in our results. Thank you. We have actually a lot of questions, um, and um, given that we have about five minutes left, I think that we will not be able to get through them all, but we'll try to do a few more. Um, and the first one that I see is, which countries slash cultures do you think are most naturally compatible with the MSC model, and why? Um, and maybe I can pick it up myself um, in first instance. Um, it's, it's an interesting question, and I've, I've been asked sort of like questions over the years. Um, and, and I guess it, it perhaps links into where the MSC has been most successful to date, which is in Northern Europe, in terms of consumers' awareness and uptake of label products. Um, my personal view is this is nothing to do with, with culture so much as with um, cultivation of consumers over the ages. And, um, in Germany, Austria, Switzerland, where the awareness is very high and where the MSC number of labeled products on the shelves is really high. Um, that's also a region where eco-labeling happens to have been invented in the, in the 70s and, and started to, to gain traction in the 80s and the 90s. And so um, it's somewhat natural, I would then think, that the MSC as an eco-labeling initiative had a chance of success in those countries. But there's other factors to that as well. Uh, when MSC started off um, as a small um, initiative and needed to prioritize where we started working in Europe, we um, looked at potential fertile ground of, of testing the concept. And the German-speaking countries were, um, for, for good reason, um, considered the best place to start. Um, so I, I, I think that in North Europe, and particularly in the German-speaking zone, because of its history with eco-labeling, uh, that would be a good place to start. But as we've seen in the consumer survey, consumers across Europe are concerned about ocean pollution, are concerned about sustainability of fisheries um, and ocean impacts. And so um, there is a huge opportunity, I think, for all of us to serve consumers 
in, in and their aspiration to know more um, to communicate about it with the MSC Eco label on PAC, especially because independent, credible verification, which is science based, done through an NGO, is um, considered to be uh, driving trust on host brands. So in South Europe, we can definitely um, benefit from that, I would say. Um, Richard or Abby, would you like to, to share something on that as well? I, I agree with uh, what you've said, uh, that, that cultivation uh, is, is important, Camille. Um, so when you look at countries such as Germany, Austria, Switzerland, yes, they've had uh, a, a long history of cultivating uh, the idea of eco labels and and sustainability is high on their agenda, but you can look at other countries around the world and uh, it, again, I draw you back to the what 's in it for me uh, in France, for example, we find that there is just a a, a love of uh, fresh seafood and uh, seafood that comes from the ocean and that just comes from a, a, a love of uh, cuisine and, and food and that's their motivator seems to be a, mo a very strong motivator for uh, keeping uh, that supply intact for future generations in France in uh, if you go all the way across to the United States then health seems to be a very dominant factor in seafood purchasing so I think you have to look at every country uh, in, it, in its own uh, right and, and, and try and work out what makes consumers uh, tick and, and, and what makes sustainability important for them. Thanks, Richard. Um, we have a last question, um, which is, um, if it is possible to get the details of the study results by email for um, a series of countries across Europe, um, and the answer is yes. Um, we have done um, the consumer survey in 22 markets and we have in-depth reports for each of them. So please get in touch with your local MSC representatives and we'll be delighted to, to take you through and send you more materials um, about the consumer survey and the insights that uh, provided. Um, on that note, you've um, spoken exactly one hour, um, addressed quite a few questions. I want to thank you all very much for being with us today. And I look forward to hearing or meeting you in person at some stage in the future again. Thank you very much, and goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.